Okay. I'd like to welcome you to episode five of Smitty's Endurance Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Smith. I'd like to welcome onto the show today, Lynn Witte. Lynn is a 67-year-old retired teacher from Mount Clemens, Michigan. She has raced at the highest level in canoe races for years. Lynn has a record 38 total Asabo Canoe Marathon finishes. Of those 38, she has 11 female division wins, five top 10 finishes overall, and has won the mixed division five times. If being a top level paddler wasn't enough, she also has several top finishes in dog sled races, most recently finishing in the Bear Grease Sled Dog Race in Minnesota. Lynn, thanks for joining me today. Thanks. How, uh, what's the recovery like from a race like last weekend? Is, does, is your body get pretty beat up during one of those? It did get beat up this time because we were in the Sawtooth Mountains and we did, we had what was called sugar snow. Okay. So probably half of the race we spent pushing our dog sled up the hill. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So it's, it's going okay though. Yeah. So how, how long did that race take you? It took uh, about 14 hours. Okay. And then I'm not super familiar with, with how those events work. So do you get to stop for a period of time? We did in a dog sled race. You have unlike a canoe race, you have mandatory stops. So we had a mandatory eight hours we had to take at some point within the race. So there were two checkpoints, took four hours approximately at the first one, and then four hours plus your, what they call your start differential. So we rested about four and a half hours at the second checkpoint. Wow. And then we went on and finished the leg. Sure. So, and then, you know, as, as we were talking, kind of getting ready for this, you mentioned uh, the Yukon quest. So that, now that was a bit further, right? when you did that? Race. That I did the Yukon Quest, yes, in 2017 with a young team of dogs. That was 300 miles. It went from Whitehorse to Pelly Crossing, which is pretty similar to the Yukon River Quest race. So we went down the Yukon, except oh, wow. in the winter. And that, that probably took quite a, quite a bit longer than your most recent. That took a lot longer. I was running young dogs, so it wasn't necessarily what I would call a competitive race. It was more to get the young dogs and to finish it. Okay. So we would run like five hours, rest five hours. Okay. Now, what's your team look like for something like that? I mean, do you have like like a little crew that helps you out? Um, I, I recruit little crews to do that. I had canoe paddlers do this last one from Minnesota. Um, but usually in the Yukon Quest, it was unassisted. So I was pretty much on my own. They started me and then um, I carried my straw and everything with me in that race. Okay. But this race at the checkpoints, my friends, my canoe friends got to help me. Yeah, awesome. So I'd like to start by, you know, Winding things back quite a bit. Um, if you could maybe talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, where you grew up, where you live now, uh, maybe a bit about your family and your upbringing. Okay. I grew up in Lexington, Michigan, which is in the thumb. Um, basically that was long ago. So, um, I grew up and my brother and my dad were probably the most instrumental in what I do now, because together we built some racing canoes, wood strips. And then my brother and I went on to race them for a while before I, I went off to college. Um, also now I live in Northern Michigan, North of Gaylord so that I can run in the snow mm -hmm. on sled dogs downstate where I taught there was no snow really. Yeah. Now what you, were you were an elementary teacher, is that right? That's right. I taught be, uh, mostly second grade, but I taught 40 years uh, K through four primarily. Awesome. Wow. That's a long career. So what about growing up? What, what were some of the sports you played growing up? And then, uh, you know, how did you eventually, you know, you mentioned your dad and your brother, as far as getting into paddling, but um, how about, how did you get into the dog sled racing? Um, in 2000, when I was still teaching, I went to Alaska as, um, uh, for the Iditarod as a teacher. Um, so I took a sabbatical from school, went there and traveled, um, basically the, um, the trail either by a plane or, um, some of it we traveled in car, but I went all the way to Nome, 
watch the race. And when I came home, I didn't want to do the Iditarod necessarily, but um, I got interested in sled dogs, bought my first sled dog. Then I bought the second one and I was in cross country skiing at the time also. So I started scajoring where you hook yourself to the dog. And then eventually by about 2008, I realized that a sled was a lot better than skis. So I started using a sled and that's when I went from there to, to where I am now. So now I own, I have 11 of my own dogs. So one thing I'm curious about, and I'm, I'm sure the, the listeners are as well. So what, uh, what's your secret for, for longevity in the sport? You know, you've been doing these things for so long. I mean, what's your secret? I don't know if there's really a secret. There's, it's basically, it's, it's become my family probably because over the years I can go back as far as Al Whiting, who was probably very instrumental in what I did. Um, he motivated me to paddle way more than I probably would have. Um, and now that I'm retired, I retired so that I could do the dog sledding in the winter during the school year. So for me, it's just something I enjoy It's a passion I have. And I don't think of it as, oh, I have to go paddle today or run dogs. It's like, oh, I want to go do that today. Right. Oh, that's a great attitude. So, so speaking of that, um, one of the questions I had for you was, uh, you know, I know you've paddled with all kinds of partners over the years. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about some of those partners and, um, you know, maybe a story or two about, uh, you know, something interesting that happened or something that you learned from one of your partners? I have had many partners, probably I've raced the Assemble Marathon the most with Connie Cannon. So together we've learned a lot of things. We've, we've had a lot of experiences, I have to say also together. Um, I've learned as I, as I went along in 1984, I did my first, what they called at that time uh, in the pro class. Before that, I was racing amateur, um, basically the same route and everything, just a different canoe. And Steve Landick was in 1984 with me, who probably influenced me greatly into, oh, this is what I need to do to go faster and to go quicker. Um, so he was instrumental in that, in making that change from training to race as far as, and then training to actually compete. So that was the beginning. In 1988, I had Jim Myers as my partner. And um, I gotta say that was probably the easiest race we had. It was also my fastest race ever. So that was very interesting in the aspect of how things can go well and they do without really any mishaps along the way. Um, probably some of my most memorable are times that um, I've been lost in the fog, gone upstream a few times, taken a few things like that in stride. But then I've learned from them also, like, you know, just when you think everything's going okay, how do I just to make it go right? So that's been, that's been fun. What, uh, so what, what are some of the other events or would there be one of those years uh, for the Asable race that, that sticks out more than another as far as uh, it being your favorite year or favorite event that you have? Um, I do love the Asable Marathon. That is my favorite event, I will say that. Um, I paddled um, Schwinnigan, the Classic, and that is that is a fun race. I like that race. Um, I raced that with Amy Solak. We raced um, kind of to go have fun. That was our first motive. And it turned out to be a, a great race, but it also turned out probably where we were in some pretty big windstorms for a couple of us, but we had a great time. That sticks out as a, as a, as a great event. Um, okay. So that's, that's one worth exploring also for those of you who haven't gone. Sure. Now, you mentioned that Steve, uh, you know, helped you kind of turn your training from, you know, maybe being more of a participant, participant to a competitor. What, uh, what, were, what were some of the key things that he taught you that, uh, that helped you along the way for that 1984 race? It did. And that was a, an inter interesting race because before that, I hadn't actually trained to race the marathon with him until a couple of weeks before it. We had both trained separately uh, until we made that decision to do that together. But just his preparation for it, um, how he went about his training as far as, okay, here's what we're doing today and having actually a training plan. Whereas, oh, we're just gonna go paddle today. Um, that was a big difference. 
and that that made a made a huge turnaround. And from that point on, I trained with people like Butch Stockton and so forth, who who had been very competitive, and that made the that made a big turnaround for me. Yeah. Could you share some specifics about that training as far as like what, what you guys would go do or maybe uh, what a typical week might look like? Um, with, for example, Butch Stockton, we would go and we did specifically, we had long, the longer three and four hours. Um, we didn't do excessives. I raced um, Michigan races with him and I raced the General Clinton, um, but we would do some long hours, but then we did more interval training and we did some lake paddling. Um, the lake paddling basically to get the canoe to, to glide more as opposed to trying to just power it around. And that was a huge difference to learn that fine tune, let's make the boat glide as opposed to let's see how hard we can paddle it. Yeah. Now, I know for the Asable race and I've paddled with you a couple of times uh, and I know that you know the river really well what uh, is that something that you specifically take the time to learn the river or is it more just that you've gained over the years just from being on it a ton? I think in the beginning, like um, take yourselves or rookies who start to learn it is, is important. I do think it changes somewhat yearly depending on waterfall and snow and ice and how things move, but also it, it's, it's a good river to train on, but it's also a situation where I think over the years I've learned it. Um, sure. So to be familiar, yes, it helps somewhat. Dog racing, like I learned over the weekend, it didn't matter what I knew, the hills were there. And, and that's the thing where I've learned is you kind of have to anticipate, okay, what do I need to do different when the terrain changes? Um, same thing with the water. What do we do to change it? Yeah. Now, Along that course, what what part of the Sabo course do you feel is the most challenging? Personally, personally for me, below Mayo, from Mayo to Alcona, and that is maybe not necessarily the river, but maybe necessarily the time and, and the distance we are into the race. Mm -hmm. um, foot pond can be the most challenging if the water is really choppy. To me, that's a, that's a tough part of the river. And maybe because I'm a lighter team usually. Sure. Um, so that will make a difference in that aspect. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that gets talked about a lot in different endurance events, and, and clearly you have figured this out along the way somewhere. Um, and some people I think are just, you know, kind of born with it, I guess, but just having, having the mental strength to get through some of these events. Is there anything in particular you do to help yourself mentally get prepared for these events? No, I don't. And I think it's just, like you say, I think over time it's made a difference. I've never been in a situation where I thought, oh, I can't do this because it's too hard. Um, I think that was inbred to me maybe when I grew up. My dad was, you know, not that he was, but he always encouraged us no matter what happened. And so I've learned things are going to happen. And in the Asalvo Marathon, it may happen multiple times in one race. So we have to make a decision, you know, and, and you asked the question about partners and that, that plays a big role for me is, you know, is that partner going to be willing to go through, okay, if things didn't go just right as we planned it, can I still go on? Yeah. And, and to me, that's always, a, that's a huge role to play in. And mentally, are you able to be capable of that? Yeah, that mental toughness piece is, I think just about everyone on that I've had on the podcast so far has has mentioned that, you know, just having that, yeah. that toughness, because it is, it's, it's a challenging event, and inevitably something's going to go wrong, or you're not going to feel good at some point, but how do you get through that, right? How do you get through it? And that's the thing is, how is, how is you, are you as a person, you know, going to get through that? And, and I know, you know, I've paddled with a lot of kids over the years and so forth. And, and some of them, it's interesting. And the kids that I coach, I coach cross country, sometimes it's inbred in them. It's just there. Sure. And, and it's hard maybe to teach them that skill that they can do that. Right. So switching gears a little bit, something that I'm certainly interested in. And I know as, you know, people that get into the sport of, of canoe racing or any sort of paddling, um, what are a couple of technical um, tips you might be able to give 
someone starting out that you feel would help their progression as a paddler? I think probably the hardest thing for a person to learn, and it was for me too, is, you know, the harder I paddle doesn't necessarily mean the faster the canoe is going to go. I think it's more, I need to work on how can I make that canoe go easily at a faster speed. I learned that from Butch too, because, you know, when go on the lake, it was like, you know, there's suck water, you know, it's going to be hard, but how can I, you know, sometimes it is just going to be plain. You got to grunt it out. But if you kind of play around with it, sometimes people try to go so hard that um, the boat doesn't run smoothly. It's not a smooth running vessel through the water, but rather it's up and down and round and round. And there's a difference, I think. Yeah. So. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure you've been in several different boats uh, from the time you started doing the marathon until now. <laughs> Is there one in particular that you've enjoyed racing in more than, more than the others? Well, there's a question, is it? Yes. Um, and, and you're right, because I started out in Woodstrip Canoes, and, and that was interesting. Um, right now, I have a V1 and a Corbin and a Gillies I've paddled many times. Um, and again, it comes down to a partner, I think. But if I had to pick the most versatile boat, I would pick the V1 or the Hassle because I think it's compatible and it's going to go nice for all kinds of weight differences and water conditions. If I had just a lightweight partner, a Corbin or a Gillies would be my next choice. Okay. And then throughout your career, have you spent quite a bit of time in a C1? Um, as little as I can. No, <laughs> I must see one is not my favorite canoe. Do I spend it? I started out actually racing and paddling a lot of kayak. Um, that was probably because there weren't sea ones around nearly as much. So I, I learned solo through kayaking. Um, now that I'm kind of up here and alone on my own, a lot of the time during the weeks, I do paddle my solo boat and my C1. Okay. Awesome. So <clears throat> one thing, uh, I talked to Solomon about last week was, um, you know, working through an injury, you know, cause over the years, you know, that's kind of an inevitable too, you know, as far as just having to handle an injury and how do you get through it? Um, have you had any sort of significant injuries you'd, you've had to overcome throughout the years? Not necessarily related to paddling. I, I, I did rupture a patella tendon paddling falling in a portage, but um, as far as actually, paddling, you know, shoulders and things. I have had tendonitis a lot, but then again, I've also learned maybe better my paddle technique. And I think that's eliminated some of it, but as far as a major shoulder or back issues, no, I haven't. Okay. So do you do anything specifically like maybe a little bit of strength work or stretching that, that you think helps keep healthy for paddling? I do, especially in the, in the off season, I used to do a lot more strength training. Now I say it's hauling food buckets around, but, um, strength training, um, stretching a lot. I think stretching plays a huge role all year round in it. And that's something that I think we're more aware of now before we used to be, yeah, we don't have to stretch before we do that. You know, think back to when I was coaching, I'd tell the kids we had to stretch before they run and they go, not today. But I think it does help prevent injuries. Okay. So kind of along the same lines, and, and these are things that would, I think, help uh, keep injuries away. But um, if we talked about nutrition, sleep, and recovery, is there any sort of, uh, you know, special things that you do along those lines to help you stay healthy? Um, I've... Uh... I've always tried, let's put it that way, to eat pretty healthy, I kind of grew up that way. Um, and just to kind of keep a pretty normal diet. Um, as far as sleeping, I was always poor at sleeping. I don't sleep, as, I don't need that much sleep. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, is that good for recovery? I think it is. I think it's really important. And I, I think probably nutrition is the key though to how we recover. Because um, if we put... Like I say, I'll go back to when I coached. I told the kids if they put junk in their body and all sugar, they're not going to recover. They're not going to rebuild those muscles. With my sled dogs, it's very important to me that 
they don't run every day. I, I, it's, you know, I, I give them a day off or in between workouts, I give them two days off after a hard race and so forth. So I kind of relate it to myself too. And to a paddler, you have to, to, in order to build those muscles, you need to feed them properly. You know, I, that's my feeling on that. Yeah. Now, what about during, you know, a long race, uh, like one of the, you know, dog sled races or, or the Asabo marathon, what, what are some of the things that you eat during those events? Okay. During a canoe race, I base I do not eat much solid food. I do concentrate on good hydration, um, using, there's so many good things out there now for hydration. And then basically I use a liquid food, whether it's a similar to an insurer or something, but I, I really do stay away from a lot of solid foods in that respect. And I try to stay away from a lot of caffeine so that it doesn't like overstimulate me at one point in time. Sure. Um, in dog sled racing, I have to stick, I have to go differently. I have to have something that when it freezes, I can still eat. Okay. So there, I do not drink nearly as much because of that, even though it's in a warm thermos, I get froze over the weekend again. So that's pretty common. So I'll eat something like a protein um, type bar or something that's cut in real small pieces. Oh, awesome. So one thing uh, I've talked again to about, uh, you know, the other guests who have been on this little show. Um, so paddling as a sport, you know, I've witnessed is quite inclusive, but are there some things that you feel could help get new people into the sport that maybe, you know, is not currently happening? I, I think in, in working from the board perspective of our association, um, it's very difficult. I think, like you say, it's pretty inclusive. And, you know, I remember when I got into it a long time, it was very difficult. And if it weren't for those original people who reached out to my brother and I, you know, I don't know how hard, it would, it was very difficult. I mean, we had to pursue it to say, oh, here, we need help. I think it's better now. And I think we as paddlers need to be aware to, to invite people to come and Facebook and, and posting things because to get with a group, I think they're going to learn the most, you know, learning by yourself. You, you, I say I'm always fast in my C1, but I think if we get with people, we're going to learn from them. We may not duplicate exactly, but we can pick and choose what's good for us. Um, and to get, and, and, you know, too, you know, to get kids involved, it's hard if their parents are not involved. It involves equipment. It involves transportation. Mm -hmm. That's a hard thing that we that we just need to constantly be aware of. And you know, if we see kids that are interested, kind of reach out to them also. Yeah, yeah. No, that those are those are excellent, uh, you know, ideas. What about some goals for uh, for the upcoming season for you? Do you have some goals? Assuming you know we're able to compete <laughs> in a hopefully fairly normal season. Yeah, hope, I'm hoping for a, a somewhat, as they call it, a normal season. Yeah. Um, yeah, Maria and I, Maria from Minnesota, Schilling and I were to race last year's marathon. So our goal is to race it this year. Um, and that's what we're, we're looking ahead to that, hoping. Yeah. Um, she and I were fortunately able to still train last year. And, um, and she was my handler last weekend. So we got to talk some more, but... I hope, and as I look at all the paddlers out there, it's, it's going to be still, I think, you know, a tough thing, but I think we all still need to look ahead and go, okay, what are we going to do? So I'm hoping as a whole, the schedule of races within Michigan or, you know, at least our surrounding area, whether we could travel to Canada, that's going to be another question. But I think within the state of Michigan, hopefully the Sable Marathon can, can happen. Yeah. Cause we'll be re We think we'll be ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, um, next I'm just going to do some, some more like uh, rapid fire type questions so they can just be really short answers. So, okay. Um, I think these yep. are just neat things to get to learn about people. Okay. So what okay. would be something that scares Lynn Whitty? <laughs> um, that scares me not very much, but, um, how about, um, big waves on foot pond? How about what's, what's something that you do for fun outside of sport? Oh, <laughs> mm. outside of sport. Then I guess the only thing fun I would do is read a book. 
because oh, otherwise I think I spend most of my time outdoors. You read my mind. That's my next one. What's uh, what's a good book that you've read lately? Um, there's a really good one called Dog Man by Martin Boozer. Okay. It's really good. It's a good book even for paddlers to read. Okay. Yeah. What uh, What is your favorite training session that you do? Um, probably an interval session. Okay. Like, about, you know. Yeah. And then go what ahead. About your least favorite training session? Running. <laughs> Okay. Running in a park. You know, there's some of those portages that we run and I do portage practice that are my least favorite. Yeah. All right. Well, Lynn, that's, that's about all the questions I had, you know, lastly, um, you know, I know like we've talked about a little bit earlier and you mentioned, uh, you know, just, you know, kind of the different, uh, a few different people that have helped you along the way. Are there any like sponsors that you would want to mention and, or just any sort of uh, group of people that, have helped you along the way? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks to all the people because honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a big community. And I think without all the people that have been there, whether it's training or whatever, um, they've been amazing. And, you know, the mentors I've had over the years, you know, it goes back all the way to the Butch Docktons, the Kellogg's, Kellogg's who are now back paddling again. Um, they were probably my inspiration and those kind of people. Yeah, thanks. And, and all of you who are new, um, just to, for, to spend the time together, that's important, I think. That's what's kept me going too. Sure. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. I will, uh, you know, upload this today and we'll, uh, we'll get it out there. And I'm sure uh, people are going to love to hear your story. They will. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lynn. Talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.